Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, wherever you are all around the world. I just wanted to make a brief um, uh, uh, commentary on the on Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, and I wanted to also then just read uh, Matthew Henry's commentary uh, on Hebrews 1. Uh, I forget what it is. We'll cover that in a moment. It, it reads this. Hebrews 1, 7 says, In speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. And so if we come down here and read Matthew Henry's concise commentary, uh, and this is, can be found on Bible Hub, um, under Hebrews 1.7 uh, commentaries, um, there are a few different ones here. I just found that Matthew Henry's was interesting. And so let's read it. Matthew Henry's concise commentary, Hebrews one. 4 through 14. Many Jews had a superstitious or idolatrous, idolatrous respect for angels because they had received the law and other tidings of the divine will by their testimony. They looked upon them as mediators between God and men, and some went as far as to pay them a kind of religious homage or worship. Thus it was necessary that the apostle should insist not only on Christ being the creator of all things, and therefore of angels themselves, but as being the risen and exalted Messiah in human nature, to whom angels, authorities, and powers are made subject. And I just want to pause right there, and I want to say, too, that, you know, back in those days, they would have had the scroll or scripture or text of Enoch in the book of Enoch, which is a, an, an extra-biblical, conically endorsed scripture. Uh, it's mentioned in the Bible, but it's not in the Bible. However, it is still found in the oldest known collection of uh, the Bible or scriptures uh, in, in, in known to man uh, in this, at this time in, uh, in Ethiopia. And so uh, if you... If you if you've read or listened to or if you've explored or prayed and meditated over the book of Enoch, uh, the, the first book, um, uh, and the one that is in the collection uh, found in, uh, the, in the Ethiopian collection Bible, um, you know, th th there's this great discourse between uh, the happenings of the beginnings of, of, of the times um, between Enoch and the angels. Uh, so much so that uh, the angels uh, in the story had gone to Enoch to ask Enoch to uh, petition God for them. And God was wroth with that because God had told them they were to petition for humankind, for men, for Enoch. So there's that little tidbit too. Uh, Christ being the creator of all things and therefore of angels themselves, but as being the risen and exalted Messiah in human nature, to whom angels, authorities, and powers are made subject. To prove this, several passages are brought from the Old Testament on comparing what God there says of the angels with what he says to Christ. The inferiority of the angels to Christ plainly appears. Here, is the office of the angels. They are God's ministers or servants to do his pleasure. But how much greater things are said of Christ by his Father, by the Father. And let us own and honor him as God, for if he had not been God, he had never done the mediator's work and had never worn the mediator's crown. It is declared how Christ was qualified for the office of mediator and how he was confirmed in it. He has the name Messiah for, the, for his being anointed. Only as man he has his fellows and as anointed with the Holy Spirit. But he is above all prophets, priests, and kings that, are, that, that ever were employed in the service of God on earth. Another passage of Scripture, P Psalms, P uh, 102, 25 through 27, is recited in which the almighty power of the Lord Jesus Christ is declared, both in creating the world and in changing it. Christ will fold up his world as a garment, 
not to be abused any longer, not to be used as it had been, as it has been. As a sovereign, when his garments of state are folded and put away, is a sovereign still. So our Lord, when he has laid aside the earth and heavens like a vesture, will be still the same. Let us not then set our hearts upon that which is not what we take it to be, and will not be what it is now, what it now is. Sin has made a great change in the world for the worse, and Christ will make a great change in it for the better. Glory to God, Jesus Christ, right? The best is coming. Let the thoughts of this make us watchful, diligent, and desirous of that better world. The Savior has done much to make all men his friends, yet he has enemies, but they shall be made his footstool by humble submission or by utter destruction. Christ shall go on conquering and to conquer. The most exalted angels are but ministering spirits, mere servants of Christ, to execute his commands. The saints at present are heirs, not yet come into possession. The angels minister to them in opposing the malice and power of evil spirits, in protecting and keeping their bodies, instructing and comforting their souls under Christ and the Holy Ghost. Angels shall gather all the saints together at the last day, when all whose hearts and hopes are set upon perishing treasures and fading glories, will be driven from Christ's presence into everlasting ministry. So I just wanted to make a brief commentary here. Um, and, uh, and, and there seems to be, have been this, um, this unleashing of wanting and a desire of wanting to pray to, uh, to God's spirits, if you will, in Hebrews 1.7, he says he makes his angels spirits, his ministers of flame. Uh, and so the angels of God are ministers and are also uh, flames and are also spirits. He makes them spirits. Um, and so um, we, we are not to pray to the angels um, we do talk with them. It's true. We talk, we can talk with angels. We do. There's a verse that says, you know, be, be careful when you're entertaining strangers, you may be entertaining an angel. Okay. Uh, there's lots of recordings of people talking with angels. Enoch talked with the angels. Many people have spoken. Daniel spoke with the angels. Um, but we're not to pray to them as prayer is a form of uh, worship. Uh, you know, when we go into fervent prayer, we're, that's really a form of worship. Uh, and so, uh, and so we can talk with the angels for sure, but we're not to pray to them. We're not to pray to them. Um, now, what we can do uh, when I had an encounter and Michael the Archangel came uh, to me, as was introduced by the Lord Jesus Christ, a wonderful story. Uh, perhaps now is the time I should share it. Um, I was I was uh, deep in intercessory prayer. I had uh, I had pulled the blanket off of the bed as my quote unquote prayer closet was the foot of my bed upstairs in my house at the time and I had um, pulled that cover over my head and, and I don't know, I was in prayer for a long time it felt like a couple of seconds but in the course of the prayer out of the darkness came the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, just then as I was, I was um, you know worshiping and in praise and worship and in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ as his face was before me in the spirit. He, he turned, he turned to his left and he said, um, he looked back at me, uh, he turned to his left and put his head down as if he was listening to somebody. You know, when somebody comes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I got something for you. It was that kind of a scenario. And, uh, and so the Lord turned back around at me and he said to me, he said, um, just a minute, I have somebody that wants to meet you. And so his face began to fade back simultaneously as his face faded back into the darkness. Um, Michael, 
Michael, the archangel's face came forward, and I'm telling you, I was in such a state. I was shocked. I was just, he's beautiful. His countenance is just awe-inspiring. Michael, the archangel. And uh, as his as his presence came, the sin natural man in me, the sinful flesh began to desire to want to worship him. It did. That's just the truth. I'm telling you the truth. But before it had a chance to do that, and just as the flesh had the thought, Michael shut it down and said, don't do it. Worship the Lord your God and Jesus Christ only. As it is written, I am simply a fellow servant of the Most High God and Jesus Christ, just as you are on earth. I am the servant in both the heavenly realms and about and around the earth. So he immediately shut my sin natural flesh down to desire to want to worship him because I'm telling you, he's, it's, these, it's, if you, if you've ever read the accounts in the Bible of people who've had encounters with angels, you know, they fall down and want to worship them. They are, um, they are awe-inspiring. They're powerful. Um, and, uh, and so, and so I did. I said, yes, you're right. I will worship the Lord our God only, and I understand that we are fellow servants. But the thing that took me back was that I remember the look on his face. He was he had a look of, as he was coming forward, he just had an absolute look of astonishment. I mean, amazement. I'm sure that he was gazing upon me as I was gazing upon him. The same look was just awe and, and just, we were, I was amazed. And, and he looked at me the same way. And uh, so, so we had a little discourse there, a conversation. And, um, uh, and, and, and I won't tell it all because part of it's a little bit of a personal thing. And I, I'm, I'm sure not here to, to brag or boast or perhaps that's something for, for a time to come, but I don't think it's yet. Um, so I won't reveal the rest of the conversation, but um, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, that that... that that encounter, that revelation, and and the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that God has given from that experience has lasted me over this 20 years and is as prevalent and relevant today as it was the time that it happened. Um, so as it ended in, the, in closing, Michael then um, began to um, fade back. Um, and Jesus came forward, and for a brief moment, they were both there together and, and looked like they talked for a moment. But in the midst of those two having a discourse, I could hear in the background, it was pitch black, I couldn't see anything, but I could hear, I could hear that there was a great war waging in heaven. And, and before Michael left completely, he turned to me and said, it was very nice to meet you. I must go. The war rages on. And then, of course, Jesus came forth and we, we finished a, an amazing time, uh, which ended shortly thereafter. But for about three to five days, I was absolutely just, um, I, I don't know how else to say it, except I was in the spirit. I was halfway in, in on earth and halfway in, in, in heaven. And, and I, I think there was enough of me left on the earth to function and get my physical body through what needed to be done. But I asked the Lord then, uh, about three to three to four days after the encounter, I asked the Lord. I said, "Lord, I don't understand." I said, "Why, why did I have such a uh, a response? Why did my flesh respond to him that way? And why did he respond to me the way that he looked at me?" And the Lord then explained it to me. He said, "Because that was your flesh. Your sin natural flesh was desiring to do what the sin nature does." He said, and my servants will shut you down and will always direct you to me and the Father God. And he said, as for you, son, the reason that Michael, my servant, looked at you in such amazement and awe, he said to me, he said, Dude, don't you realize that when he looked at you, he saw me and he saw the Father God? Remember, son that you were made 
in our image, in the image of God you made. And so when the angels look at you, they see the Father God, and they are perplexed and amazed. And, you know, that's something to really latch on to in, 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 in the spiritual warfare realm as we come against these uh, these unclean spirits. And we should certainly test them, 1 John 4 and also uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, or 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, test the spirits. Uh, remember that uh, Lucifer himself came as an angel of light and his uh, workers uh, will also present themselves as, as, as light. And they are not. They're false. It's not the real light. It's an imitator. Um, but the amazing thing to remember is, if, if you could put yourself for a moment in the shoes of Michael and in the shoes of these uh, spirits of God, if you will, and or the fallen spirits of God, which are the fallen angels and their offspring, uh, which are the disembodied uh, spirits of the abominable um, um, and the book of Enoch will elaborate on that if you read that. But uh, the thing to remember is that when these demons look at you, when these unclean spirits come to you and look at you, if you knew the truth of what they were hiding, it's this. That when they look at you, when they look at you, child of God, when they look at you, soldier of God, when they look at you dressed in the armor of the Lord God Almighty, they're terrified. They're terrified. Because when they look at you, they see the same thing that Michael the archangel saw and what was revealed to me in his reaction. They see the Father God in you. And they see the mark of God on those of you who belong. And they're terrified. Now, they'll never, they'll never expose it. That's one of the things that they work through, right? That's one of the ways that they deceive. Is they, it's like the uh, the Wizard of Oz, right? He was a little tiny man at the end of the movie behind with a big, great big microphone and deep voice modulator to make him sound like he was so much bigger and mightier and more powerful than what he really was, right? That's the unclean spirits. Child of God, you are God's favorite. You are the called, chosen one of the Lord God Almighty. He has called you, and you have responded. And you are made by Him through His Son, your friend. And there's no greater friend than one who would lay down their life for another. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your friend. He's also the Son of God. He's also God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John told us. But you're more than that. You're more than a conqueror. You're an heir. You're an heir to the very throne of God. Do you understand that you're His child, and that He loves you, and that He is the good Father, and He loves you so much? And the scripture says that there's nothing greater than love, that law, that, that, that love, that love meets the requirements of the law. And so when we, when we act from a foundation, from a principle, from the ideology that we are God's children, that we are ambassadors to the throne of God, that we have more at stake than simply paid mercenaries do, but that it's our father, it's our family, family. Family means everything. That's your family. That's your blood. Your friend, Jesus Christ, paid a debt that you could never pay. Because he loves you with a godly love. The kind of love that the world doesn't know and can only twist and pervert and mock. A real, genuine love. The kind of love that is patient and is kind. And it forgives. And it doesn't keep a record of your sins. But it loves you. He loves you. God loves you so much. And I'll tell you something else too, that when you go to the throne of God, 
covering yourself with the blood of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness and wraps you in a robe that is scarlet, washed clean and white as the undriven snow. And you present yourself before the Father God, before the throne of heaven, boldly. Then that testifies to God that you truly believe, that you are exactly who He said you are, that you truly believe the Word of God, that you believe that all of your sins have been, all of the, all of the debts that your sins have created are paid, past, present, and future, and that you're washed, you're cleansed, you've been bought and paid for by a hefty, mighty price, by the very blood of God, by His Lamb, Jesus Christ, shed for you on the cross at Calvary some 2,000 plus years ago. My friends, you're a peculiar person, a royal priesthood, and you're to be in the world but not of the world. And so if you don't fit in, if you're one of those stones that the builders have rejected, and you're one of those that never quite meshed with the rest of society, or you just didn't fit into the cliques, you know, or, or for a woman, I always like to say the click of the cluck, right? The rooster hen pecking the click of the cluck. I'm sorry, that forgive me. <laughs> a little something, Wid Worley kind of. In, anyway, uh, uh, that's who you are. The world hated him first. And when you believe, and you're part of that great kingdom, and you're one of those rejected stones of the world, then you're, a, you're the stone that the builder rejected handiwork. And you're one of those stones that the world rejected that's being used and, and is being put into the wall and the building and the foundation of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So behold, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's in you, believer. You are that ambassador. You are that warrior representative of the kingdom of God. And when you really get it, when you really get it. And the way to get that, my friends, is through forgiveness, because the Father God says that He won't forgive you unless you forgive. And your first ministry when you come into the kingdom is none other than self. And so you can take self up and you can tell self, self, I forgive you. Self, I accept you. Self, I understand that you have a sin nature and that you're unruly. And that you're like the, the unruly three-year-old that drives the, the good parent crazy, but that the good parent doesn't cast out or throw away or, or destroy and make another one and go again, but is patient and, and is forgiving and, 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 and is long-suffering to wait for the child to grow up. And, and we know that the, the flesh is, is that child that will never grow up and that there's a sin nature that is uh, perpetually going to be... Uh, just uh, just uh, like that three-year-old, that unruly three-year-old, that sin nature flesh man is unruly. But by the Spirit, the Spirit that is the eternal part of you inside of you and your soul and the Spirit of the Holy Spirit helping your spirit, which testifies to your spirit that you are a child of God, you can wrangle that flesh, that unruly sin nature. But the beginning part of the whole thing, the whole process is to forgive yourself in understanding, in the revelation and wisdom and knowledge of the understanding of God, of who self is, that it's, it's got a sin nature. It's like that unruly three-year-old. You can pull self into the mirror and look self right dead square in the eyes and say, self, I forgive you. Self, I accept you for who you are in the revelation of the wisdom and knowledge given by God in the understanding of who you are, self. I get it, and I forgive you. And I know you're going to be unruly. And I know you're going to get out of line at times. But I love you because God first loved you. And you're, you're, you're a creation of God the Father's. And you're made in the Father's image. And who am I, self? Who am I to disrespect God by disrespecting or dishonoring something that he's created? You, self, you. And so I choose to forgive you. We're, we're in this together, self. Let's make a... Let's come to an understanding of, of, of who you are, self, that you're that unruly part of, of the whole. And that the Spirit is the eternal part. 
and I forgive you, Shell. And let's let's endeavor to move forward. And I'll do my best, and and I'll ask that you do your best, self, to do what's righteous and just, and so that God's graciousness and mercy doesn't have to abound. But I understand, self, and I forgive you. Now, let's go on. Let's do the things that are good for God and that are right in God's eyes, self. And that, my friends, is the beginning. That's the first mission in the ministry of coming into the kingdom of self, of yourself, yourself. And so it's all good when you really come into the wisdom, when, when you really come into the revelation, the wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of that truth. And let's not forget the greatest command is to go out into all of the world, into all of creation and preach the gospel. To worship the Lord your God. And you can believe. You can believe in yourself. But listen, the world, evil and wickedness, has done everything and anything it can to destroy self, to destroy your self-esteem, to ruin self, to exploit. You know, evil knows your name, but it calls you by your sin. But God knows your sin, and he calls you by your name. Well, you know the sins of self. Are you calling self by its sin, or are you calling it by its name? Having the forgiveness that God has for you in the mercy and grace and in the favor that God has for you, are you showing that to self? You see, because the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And the second one is not unlike it. It's to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Friends, I'll ask you this question. How can you love your neighbor and how can you love God if you don't first love yourself? And how can you love anyone if you don't forgive them? Anyway, I hope this has edified you. I hope this has helped you. And I hope that this helps to bring clarity of who the angels are and how we work together with them, you know. Uh, so we can pray to God. We go to God, Jesus Christ, and we can ask Jesus Christ to loose His angels, His good spirits, Hebrews 1.7. And we can ask the Lord God Almighty that He authorize them to make ways where there are no ways and to give them new and unknown hidden strategies and weapons of warfare and to give them a swift and complete victory in whatever they are sent out to do. And we can ask the Lord God Almighty for help. And just as Daniel did and prayed so long, and then the angel came and helped him. We can pray to the Lord Jesus Christ that he send his angels to come and help us. Because we work together. We're both servants of him. And we work together to serve each other. And so we can serve and glorify and honor God by praying to God in regards to his angels and not praying to his angels. Now, yes, we will talk to angels and we do. We, It's biblical. It says, be careful about when you entertain strangers. You may be entertaining angels unawares. So talking to somebody is one thing and talking to somebody out of reverent respect, godly respect, a godly love, well, then you'll honor God. And, and if you do that to strangers, why, if you talk to angels, then you're good. The law is met. Friends, you have the favor of God and all of heaven. All of heaven is behind you. All of heaven has your six. All of heaven has your back. And you can believe it because that's the word of God. So I would encourage you to study the word of God, to pray and meditate on the word of God, to read the stories. You can ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation and instruction and direction and and confirmation and correction. And you can be wrong, friends. It's okay to be wrong. If you're, if you're not wrong, you're not trying. We're all wrong. 
Listen, we, you, you can't fail as long as you don't quit while you're failing. You keep failing until you, until you succeed. That's what you do. And you do it in faith, believing and knowing. And you take each one of those failures as an experience and you learn from them and you apply them to life. And what greater teacher is there than, a, than, a, than experience, than experiential experience, right? You can read about it in school and books and whatnot, but does it really teach? Do you really learn as much as when you go through it yourself? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can forgive yourself. You can forgive yourself. It's okay. Forgive yourself. But don't stop in the midst of the failure. Keep failing. Keep failing until you succeed with the hope of one day you're going to succeed. Keep going. And do everything you do as unto the Lord. The Lord is with you and the Lord will help you. Remember, when you're a child of God, nothing comes to you that God doesn't allow. He allows it. Just as Job, Job was righteous. Some say around 70 some years old when God allowed Satan to um, give him the experience that he had. He lost everything. Job lost it all. Job was under spiritual attack. So much so that even his wife came to him and said, why don't you curse God and die? But Job, Job rebuked that. He didn't know why he was coming under such travesty and or, or, or uh, uh, maybe travesty is not the right word, but such, uh, such, tr such terrible times, you know, having lost it all, including his health at 70 years old, I can't even imagine. But Job persevered, not knowing what we have and know today, which is written and given to us in the Word of God, the Bible. And in the end, God recognized him and restored him twice as much as he had before. But the point is this, friends. God allowed Satan to have at Job. And he told him, he said, okay, you can have at the man, but of the man, do not smite him. Don't kill him. Read the book of Job. It's long, it is difficult, and you may need to, you know, just take it in little pieces and bites, and that's okay. But don't quit while you're failing. Get up. Get up. And the enemy's got you down, you're under spiritual attack and spiritual warfare, and they've got you spinning around and in a tizzy and a dizzy and a storm, and they've got you like a dog chasing your tail. Get up, stand up, and say, I reject and rebuke this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to assert your authority and full faith given to you as an ambassador, a child, an heir to the kingdom of God. And remind that thing, or those things, those unclean spirits that have come to you of the truth, of who you are, and the power and authority given to you by the Son of God, by the Lamb of God's blood, Jesus Christ. And things will change. Things will turn around. It may take some time. But just like any warrior, you'll go through boot camp. You'll come out of boot camp. You'll go into the war, into the battlefield, and you'll learn by trial by fire. And with each war and with each time, you go round and round. And with each failure and with each victory, you begin to build up words of testimony. And then you can overcome the evil one with those words of testimony by the blood of the Lamb. And you can remember that you're growing into the point of being such a seasoned, hardened warrior that there will come a time, there will come a point in your walk and your faith and your fight that you will not love your life on this earth so much as to shrink back from death. And so if the destiny assigned to you in the kingdom of God is to become martyred and become a martyr, to lose your very life like Stephen and many others. Then understand. Let the reader and the listener hear and understand. Father God, we lift up to you, your people, your kingdom. 
We lift up to you all of your people, all of your creation, and all of your kingdom, every human being that belongs to you, Father God, lost or found, we lift them to you. And we ask that you would open their eyes that they could see, and that you would soften their heart, that they would understand, and that they would come to you for healing. That now be that time for your glory and for your kingdom in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.